you know, it, it makes it a lot harder having two in some ways, but it's easier in other ways. There's no rivalry about having to do more with one versus the other, which I guess some parents have. You know, the, per, the kid without CF actually feels like they're not getting enough attention, um, but we don't have that problem because they're both doing it. We knew that we had a chance of passing it on, and we kind of knew a little bit about the disease. We didn't really know any day-to-day -day things. I mean, we might have heard of it, but you know, it didn't register for us. Mm -hmm. Nobody in our families has ever had it that we know of. The Bradleys are a family that I've known um, since before their eldest child, Mackenzie, was born. Mackenzie, in early life, had a pretty good growth pattern. Um, she was started on enzymes very early in life. And so um, she grew well initially, but then started falling off her growth curve. We got scared because Mackenzie's height and weight were so low. She was always in the 10th percentile on the charts that we thought her lung function is gonna be so low when she's eight, nine, 10 because of her growth now. People with cystic fibrosis who achieve normal growth have better lung health and a longer life expectancy than people who do not gain weight well and who uh, do not attain the height that we would predict for their family. Mackenzie started noticing some slowed growth through her preschool and early grade school years and also wasn't able to keep up in the same way they were used to, just didn't have the same energy level. Every week, about three days, I'd be homesick from school. When I was seven, I was not a big fan of eating, but not as less as she was. Annika was also an infant who grew well initially and then had a big drop off in her weight gain and um, really got into an issue where she was pretty much refusing to eat for her parents. At dinner times, like, it, my dad, we make up this thing, like if Annika ate everything on her plate, she'd get a sticker. And if she finished her plate, my dad would fall off his chair. The whole meal was about how much food can we get them to eat because they would only eat three or four bites of their entire meal. The Bradleys, um, like so many families, really experience a lot of stress around the meal. Um, you know, trying to get adequate calories in and the appropriate way to do that and all in the context of working with young children to get them to understand why that's important is, is a big challenge. Mackenzie is an 11 year old girl and she had a G2 place when she was seven and Annika is eight and had a G2 place when she was five. You know, it, they kind of brought it up slowly to where they just told us about it, not thinking it was something we were going to do and so we didn't really consider it. Okay, yeah, we, thanks for telling us. It's not something we think we'll need. Um, but we had tried so many things that over about a year, year and a half period, um, you know, it, it seemed more like something we should do. And so we were still scared about it because we still didn't know what to expect. Yeah, the first time I heard that I was gonna get a tube, I thought it was like this big, like actual tube that was like this big. And I thought it was gonna be like right there and I got really scared when my mom told me. I actually didn't, I didn't think it was the best thing and I was, thinking like, do they like do torture me or something? That was what I was thinking inside my head. And I was really scared, but then it turned out okay. Because when I saw her, so she always had to change it. It made me really scared. And even though I didn't have to do it, I cried every time she did. And I never, I didn't want to get one. But then it, I didn't, didn't really bother me after I got it. For Annika, before we did it, for about a month, we really worked hard to see if we could get her to gain weight without doing a G-tube. So for a month, we were completely food focused. We gave her shakes, you know, we tried to give her stuff during the day. Yeah, and, and, so and after a month of really working hard and our whole family being committed to food, she gained one pound. Our whole lives were food focused for a month for one pound. Mackenzie gained 18 pounds after she got the tube in six months. So it was kind of a no-brainer for Annika. Mackenzie's appetite has improved a lot since she started tube feeding, and she now eats much better than she used to. Now she only gets the tube once or twice a week because she's eating so much better during the day. Um, for Annika, it hasn't really happened that About way. About this much? So she still gets the tube six, maybe seven times a 
a, a week. Annika has really had some challenges even with the G-tube. Um, her daytime appetite and drive to eat, um, along with some picky food choices, make it really difficult to get more energy in throughout the day. Um, but we've recommended that they add in a daytime bolus and help keep her energy level up along with getting some extra nutrition during the day and she's starting to make some strides as well. But instead of actually hooking her up to the tube so that she couldn't do something, we would just take a syringe full of the formula and squirt it right in. And so for breakfast, we'd give her a squirt of tube and then she'd go off to school and then she'd come home from school and we'd give her another squirt of tube. I am confident that the extra calories that she does get by tube feeding are helping her maintain her health and that things would be a lot worse if she didn't have them. We've said lots and lots of times how we feel like the tube literally saved Annika's life. If she didn't have that tube, there would be no nutrients going into her body at all because she eats she so eat. little on a daily basis that she wasn't getting any nutrition anywhere, even after she got the tube for the first two years. Now this year she's eating a lot more and working a lot harder at it. But once they got the tube, that whole pressure and eating focus just disappeared which was, is great. You know, now we can go out to restaurants without worrying about who's not eating what or can they get this? Well, it's not high fat, so they shouldn't get it. Okay, well now they can have chicken soup if they want it because we don't care because they're gonna get the tube later, so. Oftentimes, once people have started using tube feeding and are starting to feel the benefits of their increased weight. Typically, they'll have fewer hospital admissions. People will talk about how they used to be admitted on a regular basis and now they might come in one time a year or they haven't been in in a few years. Um, so we hear that a lot. Mackenzie has been in the hospital or even need to think about going to the hospital for a CF tune-up since she has had the G-tube. So you can really see that correlation now. The better she's done weight-wise, the better she's done health-wise. And Annika is pretty much just following the same pattern. So. The other common reaction that we often get with introducing the tube feeding is, oh, it's just so much work. I ha am I going to really need a surgery to get this done? The just sort of anticipation of how that will fit into their everyday life, it just seems like an extra burden that they aren't really ready to take on at the time. But that's why the timing is so individualized and that's why the family and the patient really needs to be ready on their own terms. It, it, it's like any new therapy or any new medicine, you just have to get used to the new routine. Mm -hmm. And anything new is overwhelming. Any new therapy is always just kind of this emotional, I just cannot do anymore. But then I do it for a day or two and pretty soon, boop, it's really easy. Yeah, they just have to get used to having a, you know, something hooked up to them and they can't roll around. Mm -hmm. And occasionally they'll roll over and it'll, it'll bend the tube. And then the, t the pump knows that, you know, it can't pump anymore, so it starts to beep. Uh, but that's pretty rare. I'd say, you know, it happens once a month maybe. You have to change the MIT keys every three months? Four. Four months. And um, yeah. even though it doesn't hurt, right? I'm changing it's, the it still seems traumatic for them. Even though they've done it every four months. We do it at home. We do it at home. Ourselves. We just order new ones. It takes about 30 seconds. <laughs> it's no big yeah, deal. Yeah. I think the kid's personality plays a little bit into how easy it is to do the tube. For example, when Mackenzie hooks up to the tube, she goes to bed, she'll write in her bed or play in her bed and nothing ever happens. But what would happen with Annika is she would hook up the tube and then she would do somersaults in her bed and then she would jump up and down on her bed and then she would do pull-ups on her bed and then it would come out and then we'd have a tube leak. So now we've learned that we don't hook her up. We let her do all her acrobats in bed. <laughs> then, when we are getting ready to go to bed, like 10 o'clock, we go in and hook her up and she's already fallen asleep. Now we think, you know, that's great and, and as long as people get the right information, they'll be um, more able to, you know, understand what's going to happen and, and it's really a good thing. It's really helped both of them a lot and we really think it's something that a lot more kids should get.